Hey everyone, it's Paul Rosen from Global Go, welcoming you to our uh, ongoing webinar series. Uh, this is incredible. This is going to be our third webinar focusing on the emerging cannabis and hemp industry in Africa, which I think is absolutely incredible. I'm so excited about the globalization of cannabis, and we're seeing every week big sort of icebergs confirming uh, the thesis that cannabis really is going to be a global enterprise. And I could just say in the last week, we could look at uh, British American Tobacco making a big investment in Canadian producer Organogram, uh, Mexico clearly now paving the path towards full blown uh, legalization, uh, and American MSO Cureleaf uh, purchasing European operator EMAC. All of this in the last seven days. Uh, I'm particularly excited and enthusiastic about what's happening in Africa because I think it's going to be an incredibly powerful, dynamic Canna economy. And I say that having already participated and listened through two webinars worth of incredible content from some of the thought leaders that are beginning to shape what is going to be one of the most dynamic emerging cannabis economies. In the world at Global Go, uh, we start with the word global. Uh, we're so delighted to be affiliated with Sib Zaba from African Cannabis Advisory, who's a big participant today. So let's get underway. Um, I'm so pleased first to begin our program by introducing uh, our guest speaker, Mr. Kevin Perman, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Crafted Hemp Farm. Uh, you're going to hear an incredible life story, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a native South African. African, uh, Africaner. Uh, Kevin's had a great entrepreneurial career. He started and sold his own security company at a young age and then went on to work in for and played a leadership role in a number of corporations, including Honeywell. But Kevin's really intersection, an interesting intersection with the plant is um, he himself had been diagnosed with autoimmune disease and that set him off on a path of exploration towards self-healing and consequently he received the first section 21 prescription to treat uh, his disease uh, which was a breakthrough both personally and quite frankly in terms of the emerging medical cannabis industry so Kevin's now keenly focused on hemp farming and establishing a breeding program to protect local land race strains found in South Africa and throughout Africa uh, without uh, further ado, I'm so pleased to introduce Kevin, and we're going to hear his story. Kevin? Paul, well, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, and uh, thank you very much for having me uh, to you and your listeners. Uh, just to give a bit of a background uh, about our journey and about my journey, I suppose it started back in uh, 2013 when I was diagnosed with the dreaded disease, and that's uh, when I was busy working in corporate. You know, working for a company like Honeywell, you get to travel a lot and you get to see, you get to see the world. But with this new disease that had, uh, had found me, it kind of crippled that. And that's, that started the journey into the CBD oil space about four or five years ago, you know, testing the market and, and looking at what was available and bringing in a whole, whole host of products from Leafceuticals, from Freedom Leaf, uh, so from Select, just a whole bunch of brands and bringing them into the country. That was where my journey really started, understanding the medicines and understanding what it is that uh, CBD can do for you, amongst other aspects of the plant matter that's uh, available. Along, along that road, I, I ended up selling that oils business and uh, decided that I would get into farming. I'd uh, already you know, started looking into the US and to uh, cultivating and, and getting into, into the sector. So I, I, I got onto a plane and I traveled off to the US and I started uh, my journey in, in searching for the right strain, which I, uh, which I did, I believe, well, one of many, and brought it over and started opening up a business called Crafted Hemp Farms. So if you look at what Crafted Hemp Farms is all about, we're all about empowering the local communities. There's myself, Mike Bembridge, my partners, and Sean Holstiller, um, our marketing uh, director. And what we're all about is we're all about collaborating with the community and uh, setting up farms, enabling uh, people, and really taking out the research that we had over the last year and sharing it with people. Over the last year, we've been fortunate enough to do quite an extensive amount of research and development in this field, and we recently submitted our findings. We all know the benefits of hemp and what hemp can do. And we are able to articulate that through to the sector. 
what it is that we do that's different to everybody else. We collaborate with other farmers. We're growing in Mozambique through a co-op arrangement. We're growing in uh, Lesotho with some co-op arrangements. We're growing in Swaziland. We're working in East London in the Eastern Cape. That's where our prim primary farm is at the moment. And we're also working in the Northwest and in other parts of uh, South Africa. Our focus is really to get everybody around the table and to start enabling the, the industry. And one of those uh, key aspects that we've been able to, to drive towards this was that section 21 that you spoke about earlier. You know, there's other role players in the industry that have been pushing the boundaries and they've really been going above and beyond. And with that, you know, we've, we, today, about seven hours ago, I got my section 21. And that's, and that's really what it's about, you know, sharing that knowledge and sharing that information with people. And of course, not uh, uh, holding back. Uh, there's there's uh, farmers that we, we would like to engage with on a constant basis. And that's what it's about, Crafted M Farm. It's, it's how we grow, it's how we collaborate and building the industry for everybody. So with, without uh, 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 carrying on any further there, Paul, I'll hand back over to you and uh, we, we can continue the conversation. Amazing, Kevin, thank you so much for sharing your story. A very unique story, I may say, but um, it's important that we understand how hard that fight was for you to be able to develop and um, self-medicate for your condition and it's a good sign of progress uh, that you have trailblazed and it leads us very nicely to today's agenda where we're going to discuss just how fast forward the industry has become and how quickly and what it likely is going to look like uh, in the months and years uh, ahead so i'm now thrilled to introduce uh, my business partner and my friend and my respected colleague sib zaba from african cannabis advisory who's going to guide us through the rest of today's program sibs Thanks, Paul. Uh, appreciate the, the kind introduction and welcome to everyone joining us from uh, Africa and across uh, the globe. Kevin, thanks so much for such an informative and inspirational uh, personal and professional story. Um, we're very excited to continue to follow Crafted Hemp uh, Farms progress as it continues to make an impact in the African hemp uh, industry. By way of introduction, my name is Sibs and I'm the co-founder and CEO of ACA Group or Africa Cannabis Advisory Group. Um, uh, ACA is a services provider specialized in the African cannabis industry. Um, uh, our company was founded in 2019 with the express mission of supporting the successful establishment of an African cannabis and hemp industry. We work with a broad uh, range of stakeholders, including governments, corporates, entrepreneurs and institutions and support them in the conceptualization and development of their cannabis projects. Um, we specialize in um, strategy development, investor readiness and fundraising, uh, global sales and distribution, uh, and marketing and brand development. Um, and we're honored to have entered into, uh, I think, a great strategic partnership with the Global Go team in the US uh, and Canada, and with a, a broad uh, alliance of um, partners across the globe, um, including in, in countries such as Colombia, Mexico, Switzerland, uh, and Cyprus, uh, just to name a few. Without any further delay, I'd like to welcome uh, today's um, special uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Tulesize um, Magabela, uh, who is going to be our, our, our keynote tonight. Um, Dr. Tulo is one of South Africa's leading professionals in the agricultural industry. He is a, a group executive at Agricultural Research Council, Council um, and re he's responsible for um, impact and partnerships uh, at the institution. For those of you who don't know uh, about uh, the ARC, uh, they are, they are, the ARC is a premier agricultural and scientific uh, research in institution that conducts um, projects and research with partners. It develops human capital and it fosters innovation to support the development of the agricultural sector in South Africa. The, the ARC has been instrumental in conducting hemp trials in South Africa and will be a key institution in the development of the hemp industry in Africa. Dr. Tula is also a senior lecturer at the University of uh, Stellenbosch. He started his journey uh, in, at the ARC in 2018, but before joining ARC, um, he was the acting CEO and chief operations officer at the Agri-Business Development Agency, or ADA, uh, in KwaZulu-Natal, 
um, which for our international audience, that's uh, one of the states um, or provinces in, uh, in South Africa, one of the very important ones actually uh, for, for the hemp discussion. Um, some of um, Dr. Tula's prior positions include Managing Director at Outcome Mapping, Senior Researcher at the National Agricultural Marketing Council, and Senior Researcher in Soil Science at the Department of Agriculture in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, Dr. Mkabela holds a PhD in Agricultural Economics from the University of, St of Stellenbosch. Please, welcome, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tula, who will give uh, today's keynote. Thank you very much, Sips, um, and thank you for the kind and elaborate uh, introduction. As Sposito has introduced me, my name is Tula Sizom Kabela. I am the Group Executive of Impact and Partnerships at the Agricultural Research Council here in South Africa. I'm not going to go into much details about what the RC does because he did a very good, um, a good, a good job in introducing, in introducing the RC. I'll go straight to the point of what I thought I should talk about uh, uh, today. I was tempted to say tonight, and I remember that the majority of the audience may not be thinking of tonight, they may be staying today. So I'll use today and tonight interchangeably just to accommodate the, everybody in the audience. Um, it's an exciting time for us to be living in, in terms of um, the agriculture and agribusiness uh, sector. And, and the cannabis discussion has really opened wide this, the, the, the entrepreneurial opportunity in the agricultural sector. And South Africa has just joined the, 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 the bandwagon in terms of legalizing, to some extent, the use of, of cannabis or hemp, depending on what you want to use it for. So I, I will center mainly in terms of what I'm talking about, about on, on what the RC does or the work that we've done in the space of cannabis. The RC has a long history of being involved in, in research on the crop itself, even before we knew it was going to be ever legalized in the country, because we could not just ignore the crop as an important crop that, 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 that it was and still is. And it's interesting to know that in the African setup, Africans have got a long history and understanding of the crop, and they've used it for, for, for centuries, for many, 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 many years. Most of us in places like South Africa and other Southern African countries went to school being taught by parents that illegally used um, um, cannabis as, a, as their source of income. So it's exciting now that the industry is being opened up and we want to make sure that when that, when that happens, the bulk of the African people are not left behind with all the indigenous knowledge and experience that they have with the crop. Having said that, cannabis is a very versatile crop with over uh, 25,000 uses as we would all know and there is space for everybody at the table. I just thought I should say that so that people don't think somebody is going to crowd the other person out. We can all find niches within the, the value chain that, that, that cannabis provides. So the RC has done research over the years in terms of the agronomy of the crop, um, looking at the available land races of uh, cannabis and other uses that can be used and, and what people have used it for and potential uses, especially the medicinal uses and the other uh, pharmaceutical products that can be derived from that, including cosmetics. And the, the RC has done, is, we've got a repository of a research that can be shared with partners that will be identified as we go along, because we, as an, as an organization, um, we do not necessarily want to confine ourselves in the research space where we, do, we just do research. We think there is room also to participate within the entire value chain meaning that we will also be looking at partners that we can, can help us commercialize the, the intellectual property, the IP that you've already generated, because the IP sitting on a shelf doesn't benefit anybody. And it is our intention to actually commercialize that IP. And uh, I'm saying that so that I can actually open the door wide for people that want to come to the RC to look what is it that the RC can offer in terms of uh, adding value in the cannabis businesses that people are exploring. We also have seed banks for almost all the land races that you can find in Africa and beyond. And we've got a facility, a state-of-the-art facility that we call BTP for short, biotechnology platform, where we can do gene sequencing to actually identify 
land races of crops and even animals, but in this case, I'll confine myself to the crops because we're talking about cannabis. So we can identify and verify if a particular land race is, is somebody claims it to be to be something that we can uh, confirm if that, that's what it is. And we can even help breeding further and new other cultivars that can come up that are suitable for different uses and different environments. So the RC has that, uh, has that knowledge and the ability to do that. What, where we are lacking as an organization is, is, is in the space of commercialization. Hence, we are looking for partnership, both public and private partnership, so that we can commercialize what we have. And we're really looking at that space. And I, people would be hard pressed to actually find an organization that can compete with the RC toe to toe in terms of research capacity in the crop itself, having had this experience that we, 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 we have with the crop. And I might, I might just throw it in there that the RC has had a license for a number of years now to grow and study cannabis, albeit a license that was uh, uh, only for research purposes. And now we're standing in the line to actually have to be among those that have a commercial license to go further with the crop. But uh, from our experiences and from a personal point of view, I think what will uh, help this industry grow even faster in South Africa and beyond, we, we know that uh, Lesotho and, and Zimbabwe were the first in this part of, of, of Africa to actually leak key, um, issue licenses for the cultivation of cannabis for medicinal purposes. And in South Africa, we still, for lack of a better expression, telling about how we should do it. Because there are a number of role players that are involved. There's the Department of Justice in collaboration with the Minister of Health. And then there's the Department of Agriculture that seems to be standing on the fringes. And I personally think they should be in the core of the discussion rather than just waiting for the other two departments to, to, to pave the way. Agriculture should really be pushing the case for the for the, the, the policy environment to be clarified around the um, legalization of um, the crop cannabis and what it can be, what licenses can be issued. We know that in 2018, the Constitutional Court had a ruling that uh, legalized even the, the personal use of cannabis, whether for recreational purposes and medicinal purposes. But that judgment has sort of been suspended while the government is sorting out the policy instruments on how to actually move forward with the industry. And I've had, as, as the RC, we've had so many people making inquiries to say, what is it that can be done and cannot be done? And, and as the RC, our hands are also tied, just like anybody else in terms of the, the legislation, because we don't legislate. We do research and we also participate. We offer the advice and then we stand back to allow those ministries and the policymakers to make those policy and legislation and legislations that will enable the, the, the industry. In closing, one I would like to say that the opportunities are vast and limitless in terms of what can be done in the space. And it's a crop that we're all waiting with bated breath to, for the policy environment to be enabling so that we can move forward. But I think it's a case of making sure that we all have our ducks in a row so that when that happens, you don't start from scratch, but you just hit the ground running. Otherwise, you may be lagging behind and, and trying to catch up with the early adopters and innovators in the industry. Thank you very much for the time that you've given me. I will be around for comments and discussions that um, colleagues might have. Thank you very much, Sid. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Um, Tulasi. This was a, a very, very comprehensive and uh, in, in many ways inspirational, I think, speech in terms of firstly, providing context in, in, in the way of how the a ARC has been playing such an important role in, in truly understanding uh, hemp's application uh, in a uh, African context and in a commercial context. Um, and I think also the, uh, uh, the roadmap ahead for ARC in terms of um, the amount of resources that have been put into um, developing um, IP, which is now, I think, at a very um, strategic uh, point in time in terms of being uh, commercialized. And uh, we're very, very excited to um, first and foremost work and engage with the ARC uh, and broadly um, have this platform uh, for other uh, stakeholders, investors, entrepreneurs, 
um, uh, other sort of um, governments and, and countries who are looking to, uh, to, to play a meaningful role in taking this industry forward in, uh, in South Africa and in Africa and, and globally. And so thank you so much for such a, um, a, a rich, um, um, insightful, uh, and very, very uh, frank and honest and, and inspirational uh, keynote address with, uh, with regards to the ARC and, uh, and South Africa's situation in, uh, in hemp. Excellent. We'll, we'll now be moving uh, on to the panel uh, discussion session of, uh, of the webinar. Uh, and I see in the chats, there's already quite a, quite a lot of comments uh, and discussions and engagement points. Um, and so I think this will really be a, a nice and, and robust and uh, engagement um, session. Uh, and Doc, thank you so much for, for staying on for, for questions. Uh, Kevin will also be, uh, be actually staying on uh, for questions as well. Um, our our moderator for uh, for our panel discussion is uh, is Jeff, uh, who I will hand over to to give a bit of an introduction on himself and onto the group, um, and uh, and he'll then hand over to to the panel to give a short intro before we start delving into into questions. Excellent, thank you, Sips, and thank you for Global Go and for uh, Sips having us today in the webinar. Um, myself, uh, I work at Separations, and we obviously have been in the industry and more how do I put it, the pharmaceutical manufacturing space and general utilities and supporting the industry in COVID testing, and you name it, it's essentially a team of about 80 engineers and sales individuals uh, supporting the scientific industry. And uh, I have a passion for extraction, but for extraction to actually happen and materialize more readily in the country, uh, we need to see cultivation taking it to the next level. And uh, I'm really happy to have a fantastic panel with us today. Um, we have Kevin and the doctor who's going to be joining us as well as Sibs in the discussion and they've been introduced. Um, but I always hate to introduce a panel uh, off a piece of paper when I've got such great speakers on the panel. So I'm going to ask the following. Can, um, can I please have Peter first introduce himself, followed by uh, Sile and then uh, with the uh, beautiful Loray to finish up with introductions. And then from there, we're going to shoot from the hip and get straight into the questions because I know that's what the audience really wants to do is ask questions. I've got a plethora of questions, uh, but I'm going to try and uh, balance it so that we can use some of mine and definitely from the audience as well. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks guys for having us. But uh, to introduce myself, um, yeah, I'm uh, Peter. I am a, um, yeah, a nerd at heart. I'm a, a, a chemical engineer. Uh, very proud nerd, but yeah, Kevin has seen my facility, uh, Sabu and Jeff as well. But um, yeah, ba basically, my my whole story is um, back in 2015, uh, Tony Button, uh, he's a good friend of ours here in uh, Cape Town and obviously world renowned for for really pioneering and, and, and really pushing early legislation in the uh, hemp industry. Um, he got a research license in Malawi in 2015 and as a as a chemical engineer I developed some novel extraction te technology to actually extract cellulose um, from hemp and other plant materials and actually refine it for the applications in biocomposites so that's really how my journey starts and he asked me back then to really go and uh, look at uh, valorizing uh, cellulose as a uh, material and Basically, what happened after that is we had the U.S. Farm Bill happen. Uh, we had Canada legalize. And yeah, my life just completely changed after that. Um, from all the research we had done in Malawi, uh, I was asked to go to Lesotho. I was asked to go to Congo. Um, I spent a bit of time in Zimbabwe um, and obviously now in South Africa, which is obviously my, my homeland. Um, so the last four years, I've basically been living and traveling um, in Malawi, Congo, uh, Zimbabwe, and Lesotho, basically just advising on a technology perspective, um, looking at valorization of the plant for an industrial as well as a, um, a wellness approach. You know, how do we look at the various values of the crop? Uh, so that's basically my role as a chemical engineer is looking what African technologies can support the industry, what is possible, what supply chains are possible and really where are the best industries to focus on for Africa. Um, I also have a, a manufacturing and greening facility in Cape Town that looks at 
indigenous botanicals in South Africa uh, for the wellness uh, sector as well. Uh, but basically, my passion is straight. I believe in technology and my passion really uh, for this industry to bloom. Uh, it requires tertiary education to really understand these concepts of technology. Um, you know, we need to, as private sector, what we really, really do is we collaborate with a lot of universities and uh, our business GS labs uh, really forefronts technology innovation and, and shares that with, with the universities in order to really understand and further develop and innovate uh, uh, suitable African technologies to apply in the industrial and medical cannabis space. Um, so yeah, that's just a bit about, a bit about me. Good, Sally, you can kick us off with your introduction. Oh, okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tidi Khiba, and I'm a practicing lawyer based and from Maseru Lesotho. Um, I was very fortunate to get involved in the cannabis industry at the beginning of the African boom, um, some may say, in 2016. Um, that's around the time that I first got involved with license applicants that were seeking to um, obtain an operator's license from the government of Lesotho at the time. And since then, it's really been an exciting journey with a lot of learning curves as well. Um, in more recent years, I've expanded my participation and my role in the industry. Um, essentially, that was through um, being appointed onto the African Union's Expert Committee on Cannabis. And within that um, scope, we try to coordinate and harmonize the approach of the different African member states towards reforming and considering um, alternative ways to regulate cannabis. I am also the founder and CEO of the cannabis consulting company called Wane Solutions. And through Wane, I provide the consulting services and also assist with a number of uh, advocacy programs around creating awareness around social issues related to this um, emerging industry. Thanks, Jeff. Perfect, thank you. And uh, Lorraine? Hi, Jeff, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm also a chemical engineer. Um, and my journey started off in Malawi. So I studied with Peter back in varsity. And um, back then, I, he told me about the whole approach of going into the hemp industry or medical cannabis. And I thought he's absolutely crazy, to be honest. Um, but yeah, that's where everything started off in Malawi. I worked quite closely with the community there um, where I taught a lot of the women weaving techniques and not really focused on chemical engineering specifically. Um, and after that, I came back, realized what I wanted to do. And um, I got an opportunity at MG Health in Lesotho where I formed um, part of their product development and started conceptualizing everything from the product concept down to getting it to market. So I got a, quite a bit of experience in the product development space there. And then from there, I just started focusing on that. And that's what I do today. Um, and during that time, I co-founded Hemp Love, which is a hemp lifestyle um, brand. We focus on hemp clothing and CBD products. So yeah, it's been an interesting journey and I'm enjoying it. Excellent, well, thank you. It's always good when you've got a panel of two chemical engineers on board, so, uh, and a lawyer, so an advocate actually. So we've got ourselves uh, chemical engineers and advocates. So let's hope the truancy of what we say will be moderated and checked. Um, I'm going to address a question which obviously a lot of our uh, panelists are joining as well as audience have asked. And, and this is a big question uh, and it's the elephant in the room because I don't want today's conversation to, to be too much on the same topic, which is CBD. Uh, it's something we need to talk about because it's, it's, it's really important in terms of the value chain uh, in the industry. But I really wanna have a broader conversation on industrial hemp applications today. Uh, but just to 
just to maybe ask one or two uh, points of view from the CBD perspective. Um, we know about the local scheduling of uh, the over-the-counter schedule zero for CBD, as well as your medicinal grades, where we can lean on some of that experience at MG Health and uh, other facilities on schedule four and six products, uh, schedule four for CBD and THC in schedule six. But when we are talking about hemp, and, and we mentioned the farm bull as well, uh, that kind of spearheaded a lot of development. Um, I've been eager in anticipation for, you know, will hemp, outdoor grown hemp, or grown under good agricultural practices, will it allow for the extraction of CBD um, in the value chain? Because for me, it's, it seems almost the only viable option, um, maybe a splitting of permitting. And I know that the good doctor as well said, we need to see the Department of Agriculture take a more progressive stance in releasing legislation um, in the hemp sphere. Because uh, we have a clear market in terms of a section 22 1B for medical, but hemp at this point, your views, I, I mean, is it almost obvious that CBD should be included, but will it? Uh, maybe can I hear from Kevin, hear maybe from the, the good doctor and some of our other panelists, and then we'll get into the more diversified questions. Well, look, uh, just, to, just to add on that, would it, would it be classified under the list, as you mentioned, CBD and hemp? No, no. I, I would say no. It, it's... In my mind, there's a clear classification between extracting uh, CBD from a plant to be used for medical grade purposes. But then again, there's also, you know, the laws like you've said, where, you know, CBD and deschedulars. So there's this, I think that's a great, for me as, as somebody, as, as a farmer, I would say we would want to, I don't know. It's, it's, it's such a hard one because it's it, in my mind, I've got so many people have asked me this question and they keep saying, yes, but CBD should be free to everybody. And then I say to them, well, are you going to make a medicine from it? Yes. Oh, well, if you make a medicine and you're just going to go make some medicine in your own facility, that's not as good as GSS labs and the guys down in Cape Town and what they've done. And then you're going to process an oil from that. How do I know it's not snake oil? How do I know that's where it was grown and cultivated, that there's no heavy metals inside there? How do I know that we, we, it's, it's complies to the Fast Moving Consumer Goods Act? You know, we as consumers are so quick to respond on negativity, but yet we're so quick to go and get snake oil from pop down the road. And then we want to, you know, complain on one side when uh, the pharmaceutical guys, you know, have issues with their medicines and yet we want to go and quickly buy from somebody else. So it's really in a, how can I say it's in, in a, in a emerging economy and a fragmented economy in this industry that we have at the moment, you're going to have all of these questions uh, that, that uh, are going to pop up. In my mind, I think we should take guidance from governments in this regard, and that's why we have the likes of the Agricultural Research Centre here that is, like he's rightfully said, been doing this for over 20 years. I think it stems back to 1994 in the Eastern Cape. You know, so, you know, they've done the research. They know what is, you know, traditional medicine and what is not traditional medicine. So I'm going to hand that one over for them to answer on the CBD. But on the industrial hemp side, that's definitely a question I'd like to, you know, carry on further with this, but I'd like to, I'd like to, you know, everybody else have a chance. Good, excellent, good, excellent. Doctor. I couldn't, I couldn't have said it better than Kevin, but I, I, I will try and add my two cents worth to, to what he has just said. I think he's, he's correct in saying that regulation will, will, will remain an important part of this industry. If this thing is going to be consumed by human beings, whether it's, whether it's CBD or whatever oil that is being extracted there, there has to be a standard that is met. And I, I think as an industry, we should not shy away from meeting those standards to make sure that the safety of the product is actually regulated by somebody outside yourself as, as the producer. So that, we, and, and South Africa is very good at regulating. I think we have that advantage, even as an African country to say that sometimes we are even criticized for being too rigid with the, regulation. You can't just buy a pint of milk from down the road and people be allowed to do that and, and get away with it. So when it comes to something that is also has medicinal properties, definitely you, may, you, may, you need to make sure that the medicinal properties that the, the purveyor of the product is claiming is actually there. 
otherwise people will be taking a lot of things that they think are CBD oils when it's not CBD oil, because you and I, uh, okay, not, let me not say you and I, I'm the only layman in the space, but as a layman, you will never tell what oil it is that you have in your hand. So you need some, uh, some certific certification that, that gives you the assurance as a consumer to say that the CBD is CBD. It was extracted using this method and it's used for these purposes. So I think in short, regulation, the space for regulating to make sure that safety becomes a priority as we move forward with the industry. Thank you. Perfect, excellent. And I'll jump in there because I mean, the regulation I think is critical because uh, often we hear the deregulation argument and, and it's well heard and understood. Uh, but when we are talking about fast moving consumer goods, there has to be standards and the same also for even more critical standards for pharmaceutical dosage forms. And I think, Peter, I'll bring you in here as a processor, because I think even within the, uh, the actual extraction side, uh, the U.S. does a good job here in terms of distinguishing between what is a dietary supplement or product and what is a pharmaceutically derived product uh, from an API going through to a finished good. Uh, and, and that's a standard, I think, that's also often just brushed under like an institution like SAPRA, where, you know, often that getting that split between a complementary medicine and a pharmaceutical medicine with a drug master file or an appropriate uh, dossier um, has a distinction point as well. And very often it gets bundled. Uh, how do you see it as a processor that's uh, obviously exporting globally as well? Uh, what's your views, Peter? Yeah, so um, as the doctor mentioned, um, you know, our country is actually really regulated well. We, we have SAPRA who do a really great job at really regulating the space and really setting the boundaries and the the differences from you know wellness to pharmaceutical, um, and when you look at you know what what Kevin mentioned now as well with um, you know having a a medicine manufacturer you know or complementary medicine manufacturer that has the GMP compliance. So for example, our facility has to go through rigorous audits uh, by SAP uh, as well as um, um, other uh, quality audits. Um, you really want to give the consumer, you know, the mandate of SAPRA is very simple. Um, when you want to make a claim for a product that, that this product can have some sort of alleviation for a specific ailment, you want to have the compliance in check. You don't want the customer to be buying a product where there is claims on the product. So even if it's low risk claims, you don't want to be purchasing that product as a consumer without having that uh, GMP um, or that, that regulatory compliance. Um, so when you look at hemp, you know, um, a perfect example for me is, you know, if you look at the UK, they have the novel foods kind of compliance, you know, they have um, hemp laws. And if you want to be uh, taking, uh, let's look at a dual crop purpose for hemp grain and uh, CBD, you know, um, what they've done um, and what I believe as well is, is pretty good and, and how we could regulate this is if you're a hemp farmer and you want to grow for grain, so you want to grow for dehealth um, um, kind of hemp foods and stuff like that. But after sorting that seed, you're going to have kind of a raffinate, you know, it would be really great for the regulator to regulate the hemp farmer to say, look, um, you've grown for grain, uh, you've got this separated byproduct uh, kind of uh, uh, top cola material um, it should be regulated in a way that the extractor should take responsibility to work with the hemp farmer to kind of allow them to then pack that seed sorted uh, raffinate in a compliant manner that would be regulated to uh, um, the compliance of the regulator as well for example SAPRA for us to then arrange uh, pharmaceutical or compliant complementary medicine uh, transport to our facility. Now, when we extract that, obviously we're going to have the THC percentages increase. And that's why it should be left to the manufacturer to really deal with those because we have to be compliant in terms of those THC levels. And then it would be great for us to then deliver that back to the ham farmer if they want to own the product as a brand to sell that as a complementary medicine. That would give a both uh, SARPRA the, the comfort uh, with their mandate to ensuring that there's safe products in the market, as well as the hemp farmer able to increase the economic value of their farm. So I think, um, you know, these are very important uh, and quite key discussions uh, that really need to be understood uh, for the hemp industry specifically, because when you're talking about a medicine and you want to make claims, um, as SAPRA has allowed uh, 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 brands to actually do, you want to give consumers the benefit of the doubt, you know, guarantee them a safe product, as Kevin mentioned, heavy metals, microbes, 
And we do know, you know, storage of these products are extremely important for, for microbe monitoring um, and stuff like that. So yeah, I think from an extractor's perspective, you know, and working with this plant, there's a lot of steps that need to be taken into account with THC levels, CBD levels. You don't want to be putting a product in the market that is uh, giving you um, um, the claim that there's no THC and there is THC in that product. So, you know, laboratory testing compliance is, is extremely important for the safety of the consumer. Perfect. I mean, that, that was a very good breakdown. I mean, there's so much there that I, I'd like to probably spend the next hour unpacking, uh, but I do like the emphasis you put on the extractors and the processors to, to kind of mediate quality management. Uh, and I think that's appropriate because at the end of the day, uh, and this is where I want to bring TD into the discussion as well, uh, who's dealt with different uh, regulatory environments throughout Africa. A, a farmer just wants to grow. You know, it's one way, you know, I want to have uh, an agreement where I have a contract growing understanding and I, I grow for the facility. You collect, you weigh, you bale, you process and you pay me per pound or how it works. And we, that's, that's all I know and that's all I want to know because I'm just looking for a good cash crop. And, and I do like that emphasis on when we talk about enforcement of hot hemp or pesticides or do we need to potentially remediate that because pesticides can be remediated. So can THC levels. So leaving that to the processor, and making sure that the processors and the testing labs fall within the necessary SAPRA, SAPRA compliance is, is more sensible. It seems like the best way to roll it out and uh, TD, if I can bring you in here. Yeah. In terms of uh, the interest from other leaders in Africa, we've seen Laoi mentioned Zimbabwe, Congo, you know. I, I would like to know from your perspective, how do you see the industry expanding in Africa? We see places going live, we've seen Mexico go live, but other countries focus primarily on going live, but for export purposes. Is that the right model? Um, how open is the willingness across Africa? Thanks. Thanks for that question, Jeff. So I think over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of activity across the continent, um, particularly within the hemp industry. Um, I would highlight Malawi, Ghana, um, and, and Zimbabwe as well. But we've also seen that a lot of the, you know, the regulations and legislation that's coming out is also aimed really at export and not the domestic market which I think it's an over, well, not an oversight, but I think it's something that has to be addressed because, you know, looking at the population growth in Africa and the need and the potential that we have right here on the continent, I think it's a missed opportunity. And again, with, with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in the background, that also opens up um, the African market and that also encourages inter-African trade. So I do think that more African countries need to have the discussion around what kind of models they want to pursue and not just to be aiming to, towards export, but to also have a domestic industry plan and strategy. However, um, I'm also concerned with the fact that there hasn't really been large steps taken towards the decriminalization of cannabis, which I think that is one of the biggest hurdles in these developments because you end up creating two parallel systems where one is governed by the licenses and the exceptions as provided in the legislation. But if you don't neatly fit into those license regimes, you therefore fall out of the purview of those um, regulations. Therefore, you know, if you're in possession and you're found growing hemp or you're growing, um, you know, high THC cannabis, you are still um, likely to be found guilty of a crime. So I think there needs to be a more coordinated and holistic effort towards not only encouraging the hemp industry, but cannabis as a whole. Perfect, I agree. I think Africa needs to also look inward in terms of inter, inter cooperation and agreements. Uh, if we have a facility, we know for instance, Africa is a, a PIX approved or pharmaceutical uh, internationally recognized uh, hub for the continent. You know, the ability to move biomass readily uh, within the right quality framework uh, from one country to the next is it's quite important. I think things like mutually recognized agreements is quite standard in European zones. Uh, there's a lot of benefit in terms of collaborating and not just focusing solely on export, but I suppose that's where the, the focus is right now is on the medical export. And hopefully that will filter down in terms of the real potential of not just cannabis, but hemp. And someone who is realizing the potential of hemp uh, in the textile space is, uh, 
Lorraine, can you tell us a little more about the activities at Hemp Love, uh, working with such a beautiful fabric like hemp uh, in, the, in the textile space, uh, exporting that to international clients? How's the experience been for you in the textile side of the industry? Um, yeah, so Hemp Love, we started out in 2019, and um, I would say the experience has been great in terms of the um, the interest that the company's gotten and how quickly we grew in such a short time was really unexpected. Um, we currently sitting with stockers um, in in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. So we've identified those areas internationally as like really big interest towards um, our fashion. And also internationally, like there's not a lot of brands actually doing what we're doing and that had such an authentic story to tell, um, which is the, the beauty of being a proudly South African and African brand um, is, yeah that authenticity with how, yeah, how it was started and the challenges we faced um, really makes a big difference and we really can see that. Um, but yeah, because of the textile industry in South Africa, um, I would say that that's been a really big challenge is to actually get textiles um, into the country because you can't source it locally. Um, and I hope to see that change in the near future because we have the infrastructure, we have the, we have the land, we have everything in place. We, yeah, it's just that differentiation between CBD and the medical side and then the actual industrial applications, which just doesn't get a chance to grow because they somehow they can't differentiate between the two. And I know it's challenging, but I hope it changes soon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think this is a position a lot of the farmers in the US were in and that they lobbied specifically on uh, when they were importing a lot of their hemp from Canada. And we know China is a massive player in the space as well in the hemp industry, but it only makes sense that if you are cultivating hemp for what we call more industrial applications and less of a wellness or supplementary or medical product, it has to be local. You, you cannot be moving large amounts of biomass, fiber uh, across large spaces. It, it just puts a, a, a pressure on the profitability of those businesses. And I'm really hopeful as well that we will see that because I think hemp is, is something that can do, we talk about a product that's got uh, 10,000 uses and it really is. I mean, the use of it in rope, textiles, paints, kitty litter, insulation, hempcrete for building. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm skimming here because there are so many applications. Uh, I think maybe if I can bring uh, Peter and Kevin back into this one, uh, on just an overview, what have you seen to be the most commercially viable hemp products that have really done well? And maybe some of the challenges with commercialization of, commercialization of hemp, if we talk about areas that are maybe a little more uh, proactive in terms of Malawi or Zimbabwe, when it comes to him. Yeah, okay. I, I think I'll jump in here because I think we've, we've, we've lost Kevin. But um, yeah, so basically, you know, my, my perspective has been kind of introspective. I've been able to see these things from a, from a different, um, 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 you know, different countries uh, kind of um, target to actually get this. So for example, in Malawi, this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to use the cellulose and we wanted to use the grain okay we were successful in using the grain we made hemp seed oil uh with tanya and tony and invigro and we 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 made hemp parts which is which is the food source so, so that was really great you know the, the challenges around that is not really difficult because the infrastructure in south africa exists we we have great engineers that can manufacture this and we already have kind of a hemp pressed seed oil infrastructure in Africa, you know, producing all of these really great um, oils that are used internationally for cosmetics. The next thing for us was to really look at the construction of these things um, or the construction and the use of hempcrete. Um, so really it is um, a challenge, you know, when you consider where we were in Africa and in Malawi specifically, you know, as we know, hempcrete relies on lime. Um, so, but relies on a specific type of lime. So for us to really consider 
robustively going, you know, crazily with with him creep. We really struggled to actually get the lamb, you know. Uh, the closest we could get the lamb was uh, actually in Botswana um, or South Africa. Um, so we then looked at the hemp as being more of a, a supplement to reducing um, uh, concrete ratio mixtures. And there we actually really succeeded. We actually have some really beautiful hemp houses there that Tanya has built. Um, and that has been a massive success. But really the the um the other aspect was the low grade fiber so you know looking at as a um as an insulation material so a non-woven kind of uh, uh application we we saw very very fit um you know as you mentioned the chinese you know that they, they really have the art of understanding how to grow this crop forward textile uh they we recognized a lot of um lost uh potential in uh the agricultural techniques to grow a really great fiber to make a woven aspect was really lost and um quite challenging actually um but there's really room you know when you look at the plant in winterton there's a beautiful flaxseed plant in winterton uh, i went and visited in 2018 and it was designed by tamartha another company in north carolina is the only other company and our um, DTI, the Department of Trade of Industry, invested in this and, you know, putting resources into that, um, into that Winterton plant, um, you know, there's huge potential for hemp ships, um, you know, which could be used for housing. There's huge potential for textiles. It's really just about, you know, uh, Dr. Dr. Tula's um, uh, research at the ARC, you know, identifying these genetics and really uh, identifying the agricultural techniques to really make a textile industry grow is is what we're lacking here and, and where the time has been lost. Um, for example, in Congo uh, uh, and Zimbabwe, so Zimbabwe, we also, you know, focused on just grain. Uh, we realized the potential for grain and we're actually exporting grain uh, the, uh, to Canada. So, you know, the quality uh, and the um, um, cost of production is really suitable and it, 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 it gives a, a great domestic market opportunity as well, specifically for the grain um, and specifically for uh, non-woven applications for um, housing and stuff like that. So that's, that's really been our struggle is really identifying these key missing um, pieces uh, in the supply chain that has just unfortunately been lost due to the legislation and the criminalization around the plant um so yeah that's that's i i would say yeah that's that's my p p like perspective is is grain low-grade fiber for non-woven uh for applications then in hempcrete yeah uh, okay 100 percent so uh, i have a question for you uh, because uh, you come from the uh, capital investment side of the industry um how do you see the the economic future of you know, there is a clear plan, I suppose, or I hope for cannabis in terms of the different grades, but for hemp, uh, how do you see uh, Global Go, um, AGA getting involved in the space? Uh, sure. So uh, maybe just to, to kick off, um, when we started um, ACA in 2019, late 2019, early 2020, 90% 90 of our discussions were on a medical uh, cannabis, medical grade cannabis flower extracts uh, for the export market. Um, I think the, uh, the, the wisdom at the time was, you know, the margins are, you know, uh, you're talking about north of sort of eight, nine, $10 a gram and producing it in Africa, 30, 40, 50 cents. And so, you know, every, every day they were sort of being flooded with these business plans uh, around commercializing these opportunities. Um, obviously, pricing is compressed significantly, and I think broadly, um, the understanding of cannabis uh, and especially hemp has now started to to become very um, prevalent. And I think we've seen that shift around uh, around a broad range of stakeholders that we engage, everything from governments to entrepreneurs, uh, you know, to institutions, uh, to corporates, kind of realizing the value of uh, a hemp uh, industry or hemp play. Um, 
hemp is, is quite different in that it's a uh, if you if it's the cultivation side of the business it's a volume it's a volumes play you know so uh, versus cannabis which is a um, a margins play and you know you need very uh, kind of limited amount of, of land to uh, to sort of develop a facility obviously a lot of capital to spec the facility and and so forth and and to operate in a compliance manner hemp is a volumes game and we have um across the continent, um, you know, uh, a significant amount of uncultivated and un un untapped land. Uh, I think um, more than 200 million hectares uh, in, in Africa. Um, and so there's, there's definitely going to be a, a shift towards large scale cultivation, which I think is foundational uh, to the industry for us. Um, the, the, there's a whole host of other interesting components when it comes to to hemp. Uh, uh, when we start looking beyond cultivation, which I think a lot of the panelists and speakers have been uh, um, discussing, sort of, you know, how do we think about processing uh, this uh, material? How do we convert hemp to, uh, you know, to these twenty five thousand, uh, you know, uh, kind of known uses of the plant in a way that's cost effect effective, and is comp competitive with existing. Uh, sort of um, uh, products and, and materials that have had decades of time to sort of uh, roll down the cost curve and that have had billions of dollars of investment in terms of making them um, uh, affordable. Um, and so we think that number one, uh, from an African perspective, the cultivation side will be extremely important. It won't be this lucrative sort of high margin headline grabbing play that we see today, but it will, it's an extremely important foundation where we have an edge in the way of cost, in the way of uh, land that we can use uh, and so forth. Um, but then we start to see a whole host of very interesting uh, um, applications and, and requirements for uh, research and development um, and, and developing the technologies that can allow him to catch up to a lot of other um, sort of uh, materials that, uh, that are currently uh, in use. I think another component which doesn't often get enough uh, airtime in the way of hemp is its um, uh, you know its incredible ability to absorb uh, large amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, hemp is is uh, is known to absorb up to four times more CO2 from uh, from the atmosphere versus, uh, uh, for example, a forest. And it's one of the most effective plants in the world, if not the most effective plant in the world from that perspective. Um, one of the very interesting conversations we've we've actually been having on this front was uh, and is is with an Irish company that has begun to uh, incorporate carbon credits into their business model and they're engaging the government uh, and and the relevant um, uh, institutions uh, to factor in what the economics are going to be once their uh, operation gets approved uh, as a um, you know as a, as a as a facility that can uh, take advantage of carbon credits, and based on the modeling that they've shown, they can actually uh, produce um, hemp at a at a break even or oper at operational break even with simply planting the, the hemp. So before you've done anything to the hemp, they actually break even on their on their model, um, and it's something that I think we'll start to see a lot and hear a lot more of as. Um, as the world shifts towards uh, accepting hemp as a uh, as a crop, um, and we and as the pressures around climate change and sustainability start to come to the fore, I think that's an area that is often overlooked and is extremely extremely um, um, bullish or, or, or positive for uh, large scale hemp uh, cultivation on the continent. Perfect, excellent, hundred percent. I know I'm going to come to TD just now with a question about your trip to Vienna last year. Um, so before I jump to you, TD, um, I actually want to just ask a quick question from the Dr. Tula on the ARC. Um, seeds is quite an important part of the value chain. Um, so in terms of the seed banking exercises, and you mentioned the uh, biotechnology platform for the ARC with the sequencing and the identification of uh, specific uh, genetic fingerprinting. Um, do you see that the ARC will play a pivotal role in terms of IP rights for growers for monitoring the types of seeds that are coming in and out of the country? I, I have no doubt that there is um, ample space for the ARC to actually do that. And, and like I said in my opening remarks, I cannot think of any other organization that is better placed to actually play that role given the technology that we have and the expertise and experience that we have in the crop. But I think it's very important that the IP is not just vested within the, the ARC itself. 
So this PTP, this pipe uh, technology platform, can assist in actually tracing back the origin of a particular cultivar or seed, so that the IP then vest with the, 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 the creators of the innovation rather than just cutting it from the top and saying, we are the ones that analyze it, then we keep the IP. And I think there's a lot of space where, especially in the African economies, where we've ignored the economies of uh, IP protection and actually owning the IP and making that as a business in itself before you even look at producing the crop itself. So I think we still have a lot of uh, room and scope to grow as African economies when it comes to IP. And I think the, the quicker we do in term, we move in terms of uh, protecting IP and identifying IP, the more business confidence that would be with our international partners, because they will know that we respect IP and we're not, when they come and invest in South Africa, we're not just going to then start stealing the IP and then claiming it as ours. So we should be seen as a, an economy that really respects the IP space. But yeah, the, the, the short answer is the RC can play a role in actually protecting IP and identifying IP and assisting in commercializing it and registering those plant breeders' rights. But that also is, uh, is premised on the legislation moving quickly. Because for now, when you apply for a, PPA, um, a plant breeders' right, the Department of Agriculture will not approve until the Department of Justice and Health are clear on what the policy is. The RC is sitting with about three years of uh, PBR applications that have not been have not been awarded because they are waiting for policy clarity. Thank you. Thank you for that, Doctor. I appreciate that. Thank you for bringing that up. And I think this is why we're going to go to TD next. Uh, TD, I'd like you to kick us off with uh, what you were doing in Vienna around about this time last year uh, with the International Narcotics Board. And then also just give me your view on uh, plant breeders' rights uh, in terms of protecting IP. I mean, I always, whenever I, I, I speak to clients about intellectual property, um, I suppose say first it needs to be an industry, but uh, that is presumptuous because you want to protect uh, how you're going to roll out that industry. So can I hear from your trip uh, to Vienna and your experience with the international regulators, uh, with the INCB, and also maybe tell us a bit your views on how plant readers' rights will be protected uh, from an advocacy point of view. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, just to clarify, when I did uh, make the trip last year to the CND, um, it was in my personal capacity. So it was before I joined the African Union's committee. So everything I'm saying is um, my perspective um, on the proceedings. And um, at the time in March, 2020, um, I, I luckily I was fortunate enough to be invited to the um, CND by the Dacha couple, Jules and Myrtle. Um, and they really gave me the opportunity to really learn more about the decisions that are being made at the UN level and to maybe consider how I could also assist, particularly in the Lesotho context, to, you know, advance these discussions that we're having, because as much as, as, much as these discussions are very fruitful and engaging, um, there's sometimes we see that there's a gap between what we're seeing on the ground, what the operators are saying, and what we experience um, versus what the ministers and um, some, in some cases the NGOs that do have discussions and do have engagements at the UN level um, discuss and hence the conclusions that they reach might not be in touch with what we are seeing on the ground. So it was in that capacity, it was really a learning experience um, to see how the countries engage, the presentations, um, as well as um, networking and speaking to members of the INCB as well and getting a feel for those kind of discussions. But I think one of the major takeaways for me from um, traveling there was to learn more about you know, where the hesitancy around cannabis um, reform is coming from. Because as much as I think within our circles, we engage a lot with people that are or have been in the industry for a very long time. And it, we sometimes take for granted that this is a viable industry and it can you know, help millions of people. But on the other side, there are not just member states, but there are also individuals that hold very strong views as well about the cannabis plant. And obviously this goes back to the history of how it's been regulated and treated in the past. So it was really to learn more about, you know, maybe the con side of um, the discussion so that while we have these discussions and while we try to um, encourage um, member states to reform their laws, to prepare and to advise them in advance 
about the areas where they may have concerns. Excellent. And your view on plant breeders rights, just quickly, how do you see the industry from an IP perspective? Okay. Um, so I also just a little disclaimer, I my IP knowledge is limited. However, I am also aware that a lot of African states have signed onto the Nagoya protocol, which also serves to protect um, plant breeders' rights, the communities involved, as well as the genetics um, that are developed. So I think there also needs to be more education so that the communities also know that actually they can, they have bargaining power at the negotiation table and that they can own um, their traditional knowledge, which they're contributing to this industry and to prevent a situation where you have external parties coming into Africa, creating patents that are then, you know, out of reach for the average person. So um, my IP knowledge is limited, but I am educating myself and therefore also trying to educate those around me on how we can use these treaties that we've already signed onto, which are on par with the international drug treaties. You know, it's, it's they're not levels. So they are on par and how we can use these different treaties and regulations and the exceptions that are already provided for um, to better serve Africans. Perfect, 100%. Yeah, I think the biggest thing and the uh, major concern is uh, we did see this uh, a year or two back with uh, capital rushing into Canada. I mean, from Canada into Lesotho, uh, specifically looking to monopolize in that area, looking to develop uh, locally in the space. Um, and I think this is where I would like to bring Lil Ray back into the conversation. You were responsible quite heavily uh, with product development um, at MG Health or back then Medigrow. Uh, out there in Lesotho. How was that experience? What did you learn from the product development standpoint? Uh, was it primarily focused on obviously medical export products or was there also a scope on what could potentially happen locally into the African region? Um, so initially back in, I think it was May 2019 when CBD was legalized or the gap opened for putting CBD products on the market for a year in South Africa that's when the focus shifted completely towards CBD products for the South African market. So um, I primarily worked on that and the different applications of just CBD products, um, but also just in terms of with the startup, you get involved with everything. So the complexity of moving product and um, distillate samples to various parts of the world was really challenging especially from Lesotho because one like <laughs> it sounds funny but like one month you can move products or get a permit and then the next week <laughs> the minister's on I don't know a lunch break for a few weeks <laughs> and you just can't export anything so that was really challenging in terms of just moving yeah, the logistics of the product. But I primarily focused on pure CBD products. So patches, nasal sprays, those kind of things. Try to still bring innovation into it, not just CBD oils and the standard products that you see. No, excellent. I mean, uh, it's very interesting. I like things like the technology for metered dosing, uh, you know, getting into very... Uh, yeah. It's not so much the wellness product as it is the farmer markets, but uh, it's very interesting to see lozenges. I know that a local South African company also exported CBD lozenges into the international market, which was quite a, quite a good boost in terms of seeing. Kevin, I, I think I'd like to bring you back in here as well, because you've been involved in, uh, you know, through the, all the tough, Kevin, I, I take you as someone who just goes for it, you know, like it's kind of like we'll figure it out as we do it, a bit of a Nike approach as well, just let's do it, uh, which we all kind of are prone towards because you need to be in this environment to be able to get anywhere. Um, how have you experienced uh, some of the challenges with product development, uh, seeing what you can do, can't do in the space? You've also been involved in importation, which is in no way easy if uh, you have to follow, you know, strict measures and they weren't always clear and they're still not clear. Maybe you can give us a, a perspective from your view without necessarily putting yourself in any hot water. Uh, what has been the challenges you've seen with uh, the development space? Well, in this space, I would say a fragmented market and people's uh, understanding of why we need regulation. And, and I think, you know, I always say the hardest thing to, in life to open is a closed mind. 
And if we have a society of closed people that are not open-minded, that can go out there and get the job done, whatever it takes within the confines of the law, one needs to do what needs to get done. Now, I'm a challenger. I'm a hunter. I go out there, I get the job done. I do what I say and I say what I do. Yes, there will be hurdles along the way and there'll be many, many uh, new paths and journeys that we will travel. But for me, the vision, the mission, and the goal is very clear. To empower everybody, to enable, not to hate, but to create. So the, the challenges that we have is the regulator can't move fast enough to, ch to activate the industry. And once that happens, we will start seeing, you know, the, the light at the end of the tunnel and this fragmented market now becoming a market. And we'll start seeing jobs being created. So in, me, in my mind, it's changing people's perception on what government's trying to do and getting this, the perception out of this big farmers coming, big farmers coming. No, not big farmers coming. If you think big farmers coming, then yeah, oh, great, good for you. We here, we're not big farmer. We're all individuals. We're all entrepreneurs. We've all got goals, objectives. We've all got families that rely on us and, and we rely on them in, in some instances. And that's what it's about. You know, if, if, if we could have an administration that could move faster, smarter, we'd be able to empower all South Africans and not leave anybody behind. And that's what it is. Our research that we've recently done now, I see uh, Fivo is on the, on the call and on the line. So he worked with us. Uh, he's a, a VIT student that helped us with our documentation and what an outstanding document that he did. So it's a, that, that granular detail of information that's already starting to come out from the young students, the young entrepreneurs, the youth. That's where it really is. Changing the youth's perception on what the elders had on cannabis and, and, and uh, hemp for that matter. So that's really, if I look at it with, with on, on that regard, importing and, and uh, uh, of CBD products, yeah, that was a few years ago. That was fun. That was great. And, and sharing that knowledge and telling people the different gravity ratios and telling them to go and make their own tinctures and use different medicines. I've shared that information. I'll give it to people freely. You know, we did some tests on making CBD oxygen, THC oxygen. You know, we've, you know, there's, there's, there's so many different ways we make water. One of the recent ones that I've now been working with with the restaurants is making crafted cannabis ice. You know, and uh, the other one that we're doing is hemp-fed cattle. You know, we've got a hundred head of cattle that are eating about. 20 to 30 tons of our hemp biomass at the farm out to Canafields, you know, to the Culver Wells and uh, Canafields out there, you know, one of our co-op arrangements. So it's, it's really, you know, we're finding our way in the markets, but we're finding our way in the markets by guidance from SAPRA and guidance from ARC and guidance from DAV and working with the likes of the Moses Kutani Institution and ARC and DAF and uh, Department of Land Reform and Rural Development we're out there saying that the public wants to participate in this sector. So adhering to our president's call and to the African call, it's up to us to go out there and make a difference and make a change. So yeah, so without, without giving away too much and without prejudicing my business or myself in that matter, as uh, the lawyer uh, alluded to earlier when she opened herself, I hope I have not done that. <laughs> no, I'm sure you have not. I mean, I mean, this is a question that has come up uh, maybe in some of these discussions related to things like cannabis master plans and dealing with different departments uh, across the region is I've been a big proponent and it's been discussed at different levels of regulatory sandboxing, uh, potential areas or economic zones, um, specifically for the purposes of what you just described, Kevin, which is experimentation. Um, the ability, and I think progressive governments globally do this well, um, it's a very great box, but if it's clearly defined and you have a special economic zone that has a regulatory sandbox that allows uh, entrepreneurs, chemical engineers, uh, marketing, just developing products, ideas, playing with emulsification of products, uh, how bioavailable is it going to be? You know, the, this is what I think almost clusters even like the CSR would like to participate in is how do we facilitate while we maybe wait and continue to wait for, and hopefully not much longer, 
for a reformation of sorts in the actual industry, can we not introduce regulatory sandboxing at a provincial level where there could be hubs where we could develop products? Um, I mean, I've been proactively pushing that. I hope that yeah. it will happen. Kevin, it seems you've got something to say there as well. Yeah, no, I do. Because, you know, as, you, as you're talking, you know, what comes to my mind first is uh, Henny Fenta you know, from yeah. ICPT Research Center. And if you look at what he's doing in with uh, the, some of the big corporations that are out there, they, they, they're pioneering stuff to, to look at yeah. uh, extracting heavy metals, doing land reforms, cleaning stuff, you know. They, so we, we're all doing it in our clusters. We're all doing it as individuals. What we need is an association to draft change so that we can take what the, 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 the aspects that Henny's doing on his master research file and understanding the site operating procedures and building up a specific master file for medicinal farmers, you know, developing a specific master file for hemp farmers, and then developing a master file or master cultivation file for the country and for its people. But you've got to start somewhere and you've got to have your concepts You've got to detail what that concept is, and then you need to execute on what it is that you, you started out in. And so for me, the, the, we're, we're doing it. You know, uh, uh, Paul mentioned earlier about the Winterton project out in, in KZN. Case, case a chap in Cape Town, an entrepreneur, Willem van der Merwe, he acquired it for $11 million. What does that tell you? The industry is moving. Big business and big entrepreneurs and people with money see this as not the quick gold rush and, and it's going to be the green is the new gold kind of thing. It's longevity. It's sustainable economic transformation and it's a sustainable way of living. You know, so we can, we can dissect it into many aspects of what the plant can do. We all know what it can do. We know what it can do. Why aren't we doing it? Why aren't and why is government not moving fast enough given these COVID times to activate the industry. So again, I wouldn't say it's the people. I think it's more an administrative task that is, is bottlenecking uh, us today. And, and with, that, with that bottlenecking, we find ourselves in this, this position we're in today. So yeah, sorry, I, I, had to, I had to get that in there, Jeff. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's close to my heart. I mean, we're growing, we're cultivating, and we want to empower everybody. I mean, we, we, our research and, and what we've done is freely available to anybody that wants it, you know. And, and I don't mind that it costs us a lot of money doing it. But if I'm the one that puts my hand up and says, yeah, read what I have, do what I've got, look at it, use it. We're not the best. We don't profess to be the best. But it's how we grow and it's how we share our information so that we can create and not hate. Perfect, Kevin. Uh, I love the passion as always. I mean, we're all passionate about this industry. Else we wouldn't be here. And I, I just love the continued passion because it's almost, it feels like working through this prohibitionist period. Uh, it, you need passionate energy, driving hard. And, and to this point, I mean, I mean, the experts are there, I think. And I, I mean, there's no expert in cannabis or hemp, but, you know, the guys who know what to do, uh, some of them are definitely on this call. And you know, bringing industry together. I love the mention of association. Uh, I'm passionate about this as well, is that silos need to be broken down. People need to, yeah. I, I don't like the word unionization too much, but people need to come together as industry professionals aggressively and not always protagonistically, but we need yeah. to drive this industry forward or else it's not going to happen. And it's the same way that Jules and Myrtle and Gareth drove a constitutional ruling in favor of our privacy rights. And I mean, this is something we need to drive as industry. And I, I love these events where we get to voice that, mention that, bring more and more faces to the forefront of this industry. And I mean, the facility you mentioned in Winston, I'd like to jump to Peter on this question. Are we ready in terms of agro processing? Are, are we ready to handle him? Because uh, one of the big things has been, we, we don't have the agro processing capacity to tackle him. Yes, it would be difficult, but I think it relies on similar technologies in other spaces. What's your view, Peter, on can we do hemp and can we do it tomorrow? So, yeah, so um, to actually, yeah, shout Kevin for actually pointing that out. Just want to say thank you for, for that. Um, but yes, Jeff, we, we are infrastructurally ready. 
we, you know, that facility is beautiful. Um, it was designed by a superior company called Tamafa, who really understand fiber processing, you know. Um, the only thing we're really lacking here is time lost on um, um, agricultural uh, techniques, you know, to support that facility, to make it economic. So understanding how to grow the crop to support and make that facility um, profitable, uh, economical, and also sustainable. That is the three pillars of like sustainability, you know. So that is where the gap is. Because of what Kevin mentioned, the, the um, slowness um, in bringing out the frameworks to allow that uh, kind of growth really rapidly, uh, that is the only missing piece. You know, we, we have lost time in agriculture. Let's compare China, you know. Um, we don't like to do it, but we really have to. They, they've never um, criminalized existing and ready to be used. So it's the same with the medical market. You can't just throw the seed. If you want to grow for a high CBD crop, you got to put nutrients, there's, there's certain practices, you know, the same with the fiber, you know, the same with the cultivars. There's certain cultivars that will give you a better cellulose fiber than a, a, a different cultivar, you know. Uh, there's, there's seed selection that needs to be in play. And that's why um, the doctor's uh, pro, uh, work at the RC is very important. So we are ready. We are very ready. We, we have SAPI as well, which is a paper and pulp industry that does really well. You know, it, 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 does, it does extremely well. We, we can support that as well with nanomaterials um, that can be used as reinforcement agents. I mean, the president recently just announced uh, massive global investments into the automobile industry into South Africa. A lot of the, um, you know, a lot of those dashboards and a lot of those doors and, you know, the boot, your, your boot cover where you literally, that closes your, your that hides your boot, you know, that, that little, little flap that literally just closes your boot. You know, a lot of that is actually a biocomposite, you know, and a lot of it is actually from hemp from Canada. Not a lot of people really realize that, but those small little pieces come into play and fit into the puzzle. And, and the only missing link is the agricultural knowledge that we've lost. Thank you for that, Peter. Yeah, absolutely, those BMW dashboards. Uh, such a shame and pity that that's having to be sent from Canada so that we can be more green and BMW wants to be more green and, and drive this and say, look, it's a lighter construction biocomposite. It's better for the fuel efficiency on the car. It's a greener building, a greener construction material. But now we're going to ship this from across the other side of the world. Come on, guys. We know we're going to get the green aligned in terms of industry and regulation. And I think this is really why I love good policies by, by BMW on this. But can we not align ourselves locally so that we can kind of see it through in terms of what it was intended for? And um, yeah. in terms of, I see we're entering the last few minutes. Um, I had a quick question, Peter. I want to just address it for a minute. Um, I saw in the panel, there was a question about, do we have decortication? Does that uh, facility in Winterton uh, provide good decortication? Yes. yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So that question is answered in the questions. I think we've covered a lot of those questions there. And I think with our last 10 minutes, uh, if I can ask every individual in our panel, um, you know, we, we've got a little passionate year and uh, I think I'd like to drive on that passion is, what do you take as a positive indication of what you anticipate and hope to see in the next, if we talk 2021 is the year we come out of this COVID slump and we start driving new sectors, new industries forward. How do you see the next few years playing out uh, in this space? And if we can put a positive spin on it with the anticipation, let's say for instance, in our audience today, we have someone from the Department of Justice, someone from Agriculture, uh, you know, DL, <laughs> someone from SAFRA, uh, and even someone from Parliament and maybe even the president on, the, on, on your listening. What is it that should happen in the next few months? And if everyone can kind of curtail yourself to about two minutes. That should bring us in as a strong closing before we go to SIBS to close us out for the webinar. If I can just uh, hear your perspectives on what you see or would like to see in the industry. You should go first. Yeah, go for it, Peter. And then we go to, let's do uh, Peter, the doctor, Kevin, uh, Lorraine. Uh, I see that we lost uh, 
uh, TD, but if she comes back on and then Sibs will close with you. Yeah, so I mean, what I would like is 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 basically to see, you know, ARC come out with the research, which is the IP that they are willing to share um, and allow DAF and SAPRA to make the regulatory framework around this research that the private sector, the institutional sector is making on seed and cultivation practices. And I'd like to see a, a divide between okay, industrial application and medical application, but also allowing the uh, uh, hemp industry to be regulated then um, jointly by DAF and SAPRA to allow economic stimulation in the private sector. So that's, that's basically what I want. Uh, I would like to see those seeds that are internationally recognized for the BMW dashboards to be brought commercially into this country and to allow us to do that so that engineers and entrepreneurs and educational institutions can really look at that as a viable industry. Um, so that when we have, um, you know, uh, entrepreneurs in the tertiary sector, they can now, instead of looking at a, you know, as a chemical engineer, I should be out at Secunda, at Sassel, you know, distilling petrol. I would like another chemical engineer to be able to say, okay, well, I can use my degree to make automobiles through cellulose enhancement uh, from an agricultural crop. That's, that's basically what I would like to see in the next year. Awesome, and uh, if I can go to the doctor next. Uh, doctor, what would you like to see in the next uh, year coming out? Yeah, Jeff, you said two minutes. I'll give it to you in 20 seconds. For me, it, it would be policy clarity going forward because I think that's what's holding the industry back. And with that, an exclusive um, sector that does not leave out the, the, the millions of Africans that have been growing this crop for years and have, been, um, have suffered the brunt of the being illegal producers of the crop, but actually bring them to, into the mainstream so that we don't marginalize them even further. Thank you. Perfect, 100%. Yeah, in, indigenous knowledge systems needs to come to the forefront somehow in this space. Uh, TD, if you can give us uh, your hopes for this year. My hopes for this year, I would like to see more countries decriminalizing cannabis because I think it's crazy to have it still be treated as um, you know this prohibited plant, but at the same time allow a parallel system where um, you know a very small fraction can actually benefit from its um, potential. Um, I would also like to see more inclusive models being developed that do include traditional leaders, tradi traditional farmers and smallholder farmers. And I would also like to see uh, more growth in the African um, domestic markets, um, more use of cannabis products and hemp products locally. Perfect. Uh, Lorraine, if you can hit us next. Um, okay, so I would love to see hemp being grown as an intermediate crop for our big agricultural industry um, because there's so many benefits through that and to see um, processing facilities being set up in the different agricultural hubs where it's like a centralized system for textile, the textile industry and the other um, byproducts of the plant so that's more on the industrial application um, and then to completely divide that when it comes to the medical space and the CBD space because it should be treated completely differently um, and in terms of the medical side and also just the CBD retail space and the product side to really learn from what more, like the governments are doing internationally to not reinvent the wheel. Like they are good examples, the Canadian model, um, we can learn from the mistakes that the FSA are making with the novel food application and things are, have drastically changed just on that front. Um, initially products didn't need to have their own product information files. Now every product's treated um, as if it's a medication. And you can see that everyone's just trying to figure out how to regulate this and where to draw the line in terms of, yeah. So I think within the next six months, we'll definitely see a lot of clarity in terms of that. And we can learn from that instead of going through that same tedious process. Use the examples that are out there. Yeah. Perfect, I understand, I fully agree. I mean, novel foods, I'd love to spend so much more time with you guys. Uh, 
I think I need another four hours uh, so we can unpack some more. But let's jump to Kevin. Kevin, give us your your enthusiastic, passionate plea to industry, and then we'll jump to Sibs with your closing remarks. Well, look, uh, you know, listening to what everybody had to say, I, I suppose I concur with everybody uh, that it were before me on what they'd like to see for next year. But ultimately, the, what the doctor said actually stuck out for me is the regulation and the clarity on the regulation and commercializing it and actually opening up the industry so that we can attract public private participation so that we can show big business and big corporations that they've got a, a, a moral obligation and a duty of care to small to medium enterprises with a key focus on empowerment of black women from previously disadvantaged backgrounds, I think is, is a key aspect of what our business is for. And, and, and if you look at it today, there's not enough of that. We need more of that. So my wish and what I'd like to see next year is like the doc said, is clarity on the regulation, more empowerment, public private participation and big corporations reaching out to us young entrepreneurs who have got the passion, have got the aspirations to go and break the door down and get things done and innovate the ability to sit at the table and empower us all. So Jeff, everybody, thank you. I hope that was inspirational, but that's, that's it for me. Perfect, Sips, you, you close us out. Uh with uh, your views on it. Uh, if there's any questions you need to address, uh, let's hear your final remarks uh, closing us out of the webinar. Thank you so much. And before I go, thank you to the awesome panelists. Thank you to everyone who's still watching. I see our participation rate is so high still. I wish there was so much more time to address questions. I'm sure we'll try to, to do more of these webinars to constantly iterate and provide better feedback and hopefully also some guidance to industry and government who will be watching this because I know I'll be sending them this webinar once it's publicly released. So I can assure you, uh, I will send it to Parliament, DALR, SAFRA, and everyone, so that it can be in everyone's hands so there's no excuses for why they don't know what industry is up to. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, very good job moderating the session today. Um, so on my side, um, what I would really like to um, focus on and, and, and sort of encourage um, not only to sort of the, the, the incredible panel we've had today, but also to many of the listeners uh, from around the world is the, the importance of, of driving home uh, this, uh, you know, this um, mission of re-educating. Um, you know, when we look back at, um, at this period in history, so, you know, fast forward 20, 25, 30 years, um, we're gonna look at uh, probably a five to 10 year period where countries gradually uh, and societies gradually shifted towards um, accepting uh, uh, the cannabis plant and its, its wide range of applications or across healthcare, wellness, um, across industrial uh, uses. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it's going to have taken a five to 10 year period is because of the fact that people have got a, a, um, a very drastic misconception about what this plant is and what it represents. Um, and so, you know, initiatives such as this webinar um, and, uh, and many others, I mean, there's many other sort of uh, operators that are really trying to drive this educational aspect of this industry forward. Um, I think that that starts to begin to um, open a, a, a door of, of, um, of possibilities and th it starts to create an environment where uh, the, the decision makers, uh, politicians, uh, leaders in corporate civil society begin to embrace this plant and that starts to see an acceleration of the embrace of, of cannabis across its broad range of uses. Um, and so education is at the heart of, um, of what we do. Um, uh, a lot of that is, uh, you know, a matter of being smart and strategic and diplomatic about that educational uh, drive. Um, but slowly but surely, we start to see those dividends. And I think we need to continue uh, really, really driving that point uh, home across across the board. Um, secondly, um, I'd say collaboration. Um, uh, as, uh, as I think it's been sort of alluded to a number of times on this uh, uh, webinar, one of the big challenges in this industry is that um, um, entrepreneurs, operators tend to work in silos. Um, um, I'm really, really grateful for uh, Dr. Um, Atula's um, keynote where he 
very openly said, look, ARC has got IP, we've done a lot of work, we've invested money in this, and we are looking for partners who want to collaborate with us in order to ensure that this, um, you know, this IP has has, uh, has a commercial roadmap and, and um, it results in high impact um, uh, sort of development and uh, high impact um, uh, sort of shift in, in, in the African landscape. And I think, at this point in the industry where things are so new with, and where things are so difficult and challenging, collaboration and opening uh, ourselves up to, uh, you know, in the way of partnerships, um, in the way of uh, knowledge, in the way of networks um, is the only way we can really ensure that um, this, this industry is, 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 has broad-based uh, success for uh, different groups uh, within our societies. Um, and so um, I'd really like to implore on, on all of us to, to really, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, collaborate, network, engage with, uh, with uh, you know, with, with, uh, with this other stakeholders in the industry. We're always available um, at ACA. Um, I think most of you have our details, any questions, any, um, any comments. If you want to have a, a discussion on this industry, we're always very, very open. Um, uh, and then also, I think, uh, as, as discussed by quite a few panelists, uh, this industry presents an incredible, incredible opportunity for broad-based uh, development uh, and rural development uh, across the continent. And I think it's up to us as sort of the early movers, the pioneers, the entrepreneurs, uh, the uh, experts on 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 uh, on on panels, the um, the operators and decision makers within companies uh, to craft and mold uh, uh, or help craft the mold this industry to how we would like it uh, to look, which I think we would like it to to have a broad based impact across communities and 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 societies um, um, uh, across Africa. Um, and so with that, I would like to thank every single one of our panelists for such an engaging um, and, and rich discussion on the African hemp industry. Um, I think there's never really a, a panel with, with such a great caliber of, of speakers and participants where you don't learn something or you're not challenged in a view um, or, you start to quest, or you start to think about how to look at something in, in a different way. And I think that has been the case I, I, I'd like to think for most, if not all of us uh, today. I'd like to thank Global Go, our strategic partner in the US and the Global Go team that has done a fantastic job uh, in sort of running everything uh, uh, around this cannabis uh, uh, Cannabis and Hemp webinar in the background and ensuring that everything runs smoothly. We'd like to thank all of our uh, attendees. Um, I think a very, very robust engagement uh, on the chat. I haven't actually been able to, to get back to some of these uh, questions, but um, very encouraged by the depth and the um, and the quality of some of the questions and comments uh, and at attendees um, on this on this webinar. And so with that, I'd like to close and say thank you so much for uh, attending uh, today's uh, webinar. Um, we will be announcing our next one, which should be actually uh, next month um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and sort of a, a few more uh, announcements around uh, events uh, going into, into 2021. Thanks again, everyone. Really appreciate uh, your time today. And we look forward to, to hearing uh, from you and fostering uh, a, a strong network of, of collaborators um, and people that are helping to, to educate the broader population on the potential of this incredible plant. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, audience. Cheers. Thanks, everybody.